I am an earthling by birth. You're an earthling by birth? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's good. I don't know if this is any good for your, uh, for your target audience. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see, and do you, I've been told that you like science fiction. I love science fiction. So what, do you have any favorite science fiction writers? Yes, um, this is going to sound terribly old fashioned, but Isaac Asimov uh -huh. was one of my favorites. Um, obviously Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Ray Bradbury is very good. The, um, over the years, I'm trying to think, William Gibson. William Gibson. Uh, How about, tell me, can you tell us a little bit about some of your favorite aliens? Yeah, I knew this question was coming and I've been thinking about it. Now, obviously, Mork and Mindy, it's not going to cut it. Mork and Mindy are your favorite aliens. <laughs> yes, wow. Mork. Uh, so I'm actually trying to, uh, trying to think of some, some other aliens that... Uh, I thought about E.T. E.T. was interesting, but not very believable. Really? Mork and Mindy were more believable as aliens? Why, why is that? Why is that? <laughs> I think with Mork and Mindy it was quite obvious <laughs> that it was satire. My favourite Martian I used to like. Oh, my favorite. that's an old one, right? Yes. I used to watch that when I was a kid. Yep, and uh, let's see, I'm trying to think, who did they meet in Lost in Space? Well, what about these aliens makes them your favourite? What do they have to have? Do they have to have... Right. A, uh, a bit of wit. A bit, bit of, of humour. Yes. So I didn't know that that was part of the requirements to be an alien. Yes, I think the ones I like have a bit of wit. I think they're a bit of, uh, they're somewhat, uh, I was about to say human. Uh, which somewhat is human. Somewhat human in that uh, they're not just a one-dimensional personality. So I should say they're somewhat, they're conscious, sentient beings of well-rounded personality. Now, do you speak Martian at all? No, I'm afraid not. I'm thinking of learning the script. Oh, they have a script, do they? They have a script and... Oh. Uh, Only one script, though. Uh, right. I think it might be a little bit like China. I think simplified... The simplified script is now in general use, but um, I think there are many different languages that use a variety of similar symbols. So it might be a little bit like, uh, like the kanji uh, and the hiragana in, in Japanese, where you've got that sort of mix of symbols and then... If you're Japanese, you can read the symbols, but your language has nothing in common with the Chinese, who can also read. Okay, now, do, are we alone in the universe? Definitely not. Um, I think we've had this discussion before, <laughs> many times, but uh, I have a strong belief that even though I don't think intelligent life is common, I think, given how vast the universe is, I find it inconceivable that it's happened only once. And by it, you mean? Intel the evolution of an intelligent technological society. Probably spacefaring, maybe only with the robots. But I think in the last 50 years, we've started to make our impact on the local, um, the local solar system neighbourhood, certainly. And the Pioneer probe has now left the solar system. Give us a few more hundred years, and I presume there'll be all sorts of space junk flying off in all sorts of places, but space is really, really big, as you know. And the chance of us actually encountering another civilization, uh, occupying the same space and the same time as we do, is, I would say, impossible, almost close to impossible. Unless, of course, we're lucky enough that some technological aliens have left some artifacts on the surface of the moon or uh, on Mars or somewhere as a sort of an alarm system for when we, uh, when we finally do manage to break the, break the bounds of the Earth and actually live on the Moon or Mars. Okay, so let me ask you again. Are we alone? No. Why? Why? Because I don't think that the evolution of intelligent technological life on Earth was so, such, so much of a, an amazing co coincidence that it can't happen again in the in the universe, which is absolutely vast, even in the galaxy. I think um, the Drake equation, of course, the really uncertain term is the, um, what's the chance of an intelligent technological civilization evolving? And that one is constrained by exactly one point, which is us, of course, and that doesn't tell us a lot. But the fact that we know it can happen, I think means it will have happened in other places. So if something has happened, you mean it, that means it can happen in other places? Yes. Now, I should say here 
that I am absolutely convinced my research obviously is looking at uh, radio emission from complex organic molecules in the interstellar medium, the stuff between the stars, and it's very clear that all the building blocks for life are actually uh, are actually developing in molecular clouds exactly the same place where stars and planets evolve. There's plenty of comets and meteorites to bring that raw material to the surface of the planet once it cools down and there um, are good ways of explaining how they all got together to make the simplest living things akin to the blue-green algae, the very simple celled organisms that dominated our planet for about 2.5 billion years before um, we actually had the multicellular organisms evolving. The multicellular organisms is a bit of a harder task, but I suspect it will happen, 2.5 billion years, provided we have the conditions, and I think that there must be many planets about the same size as the Earth around, at a similar orbit, around sun-like stars, in which case you should have liquid water, etc., uh, which would give plenty of time for 2.5 billion years, maybe even 4 billion years to elapse before you get that mutation which cause, causes a multicellular organism to uh, appear. At that stage, uh, how much further than that does it go? I could imagine that um, you may find that bacteria are very common on other planets. I would argue that uh, any solar system that has a planet in the habitable zone will have bacterial life on its surface. I can't be sure of that, but I think there's, there are good arguments that, uh, that this will happen, given long enough. Uh, getting from multicellular organisms, even to sea life, etc., that obviously is getting harder. But I would still argue that, uh, that there is an ad adaptation pre uh, pressure, which means that Although most mutations are hopeless and immediately kill the, um, the carrier, uh, there will be the odd mutation which adds a little bit of complexity which just gives that organism a little bit of um, an advantage over everything else around. Okay, and uh, let's, have you ever been to Mars? No, I haven't. Unfortunately, I haven't even managed to make it to the moon, which I'm uh, quite distressed about. It's still a little bit expensive, so I'm waiting for the price to come down. Oh, would you volunteer for the one-way trip to Mars? Ah, <laughs> it's not an immediate no. I, um, I think I'd, but I'd want to be able to have a good life there, I think. What does that mean? I mean, breathe, eat, lots of books to read, <laughs> the internet. Okay, now what kind of alien would you most like to meet? Oh, that's very easy. Um, you know that alien that all the people used to see in the 1950s and 1960s? The one with the, the big eyes and the sort of bit like Edvard Munch's scream, this painting the scream? Oh. That one, that's the one. What if it starts screaming? Well, <laughs> I have thought for many years that I would prefer to meet an alien than be safe. Than be safe? Yes. How does that work? Right. Even if the alien kills me, I would be just so fascinated to actually meet a sentient creature from outer space that I wouldn't care. How sentient does it have to be? Ah, sentient enough to have a conversation with, I think, or at least communicate with. So a conversation about uh, whether the sun is shining? Perhaps just a conversation with gestures and... So could you uh, gesture for us and show us what the kind of gestures you would try? Yes, I think we'd do things like human, alien, and presumably the alien. <laughs> yeah, sorry, don't ask us to disturb you. <laughs> uh -huh. So could you just show me those gestures again? Yes. So I'm, let's put it out. I'm an alien and You're I've an come alien. to talk okay. to you. And what are you going to do? Human. Human, human, Maria, Bob, alien. <laughs> okay, and, and now what? Actually, I suspect it could be very much like uh, a conversation I saw in San Pedro de Atacama, if you don't mind me digressing. 
Yeah. San Pedro de Atacama is one of the most divine places on the, on the planet. Um, it's very close to the Alma telescope and there's a heap of other telescopes and I go there quite regularly. It's also a lovely backpackers town and they also have the Dakar that goes through. Uh, the what? It's the Dakar, D-A-K-A-R. It's a motorbike race. I, it may not just be motorbikes, but they're the most visible thing. And it goes through Argentina and probably bits of, uh, of Paraguay, I think, as well, and Bolivia. And so it's a big circuit around Argentina, etc. And I don't know exactly the rules, rules, but I think it's some sort of rally type thing. So you ride your motorbikes a certain distance each day. And the, um, there's something that I find absolutely fascinating. I speak uh, not very fluently, although I can read both. I can speak sp French and uh, Spanish. And the two languages are amazingly similar, even if they don't sound so similar. And one of the things I do have discovered from being in San Pedro is that there's a lot of uh, French people in the Dakar with beautiful motorbikes. Uh, and there's also a lot of French tourists. And so there was this great conversation between a Frenchman who wanted his motorbike uh, jacket washed and the French don't bother to learn Spanish, they just speak French very slowly. And this seems to get them a long way. Uh, and so the guy went into the little shop where they advertised La Bardoc, which is washing, and he goes in with his, uh, and shows his jacket. And he says, La Bardoc? And the woman says, si, si. And he says, Paman. And she says, okay, Paman. And then he showed, points to his hand and she said, ah, paramano, paramano. What is that? <laughs> they both mean the French. So pama is by hand in the French, paramano. Oh. So with the gesture, they were able to communicate. Now, French and Spanish are very close languages, I will say. And then she looked at him blankly as if to say, there is no other way here. <laughs> we are a desert. <laughs> we cannot use washing machines. <laughs> oh. There is no water. <laughs> So you think that you can uh, talk to aliens with hand gestures? I would start there. What now, if they don't have hands? Well, then it becomes much more difficult. And um, the universe is uh, not only stranger than we imagine, it's stranger than we can imagine. And that means that aliens could be, for example, big round blobs. Maybe they could be like amoeba. Maybe they could uh, sprout limbs when they need it and I think that it would be far more difficult although I would argue that when you get to the spacefaring variety of aliens I do think they will need some sort of limb and some sort of ability to grip controls etc unless they've got the telekinesis down pat well if you could talk to an alien if you could ask questions is there any particular questions you would ask yes have you been in contact with other aliens what can you tell me uh, What's your physics like? Uh, what do you know about physics? Let's try and match up what we know. Uh, how do you do mathematics? Those would be the questions uppermost. Oh, and then I, of course I would move on to how is your society organized? Do you have genders? Um, what other questions would there be for an alien? That would probably be not bad to go on with. <laughs> Some people think that they would just solve all the equations of physics or so theory of everything, or maybe solve all our ethical dilemmas. Not a hope. <laughs> not a hope. <laughs> so, you're, so you're not hoping to get that information from aliens? No. I think we could um, have some excellent cultural exchanges, and I think we could perhaps find new ways to look at problems. But uh, I... I don't buy the myth of the utopian alien civilization and the, uh, and the perfect alien any more than I buy the noble savage myth. Okay. Have you ever seen a UFO? Never. It's one of the great, con great disappointments of my life. Everyone else I know sees UFOs. I used to even work, uh, a very nice gentleman when I was running the observatory out at uh, what's now the, what is it, Western Sydney University. Um, a lovely guy used to take reports of UFOs uh, and he'd ring me and sort of say, can you identify this with an astronomical object? Sadly, every time I was able to, and nine out of ten times it was Venus. Nine out of ten times it was Venus? Venus. What was the other ten times? The other one, oh, I think it was 10%. Mars. Venus and Mars? Yes. I think possibly Mars because it is quite bright and especially... Uh, if it's a close approach to us. I think it, it does form a disc on the eye. Venus, I used to wonder how on earth anyone could do, 
mis mistake a planet for a UFO until I actually saw it one day. I was in Outback, New South Wales, uh, and it's very, very flat and very hot, so 40 degrees and the horizon's completely flat. And I was looking out just, a little, just around sunset and I was looking at Venus saying, isn't that lovely? And then it turned red and green and darted all around the sky. And if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. And I thought, you know, if I didn't know that was Venus, I would have just assumed that that's a UFO. Now, I'm sure people have, have explained, uh, you know, different layers of temperature near the Earth's surface on a flat horizon on a hot day, etc., and uh, refraction of colours through the atmosphere and scintillation, but it was impressive. <laughs> and I think this is why people see spaceships darting quickly around the sky with red and green. So when somebody tells you, I've seen a UFO, uh, and do you, what do you do? You don't poo-poo them, you say... Well, I ask them about it. I say, tell me about it. Uh, and quite often... I might just listen to the story. Uh, really quite fascinating was once at Sydney, um, Sydney's Latitude, I uh, had a woman describe to me she was driving along the freeway out near the Blue Mountains and it was quite a dark night and she saw a grey shimmering curtain down to the south and she was saying, what do you think that could have been? And I said, look, it sounds like an aurora, aurora australis, but I would have thought we were too far from the pole to get them, but I found out apparently they are really but just occasionally seen at Sydney Latitudes. And so, so yes, I'm always curious. Um, also, I would actually, unfortunately, occasionally I have read stories of people who've been abducted by aliens. Have you talked to anybody who's been abducted by aliens? Uh, yes. So how did um, that go? Tell us about that. Right, okay. Um, the, uh, the, there's uh, someone rather famous, so I won't give any more details away. Uh, because I don't want to identify them. And why uh, don't you want to identify them? Um, it could be... Well, that's a good question. I guess if they believe they've met aliens, they probably don't mind other people knowing. <laughs> Unless <laughs> they've told you, right? <laughs> Unless they've told you in confidence, I guess. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't in confidence, but uh, I was um, giving a talk somewhere once and uh, someone actually came up and explained uh, that, in fact, they'd... Um, come from a refugee colony on Alpha Centauri and, um, and then came to Earth and uh, I was saying, oh, that's interesting. And then someone sort of came and grabbed me <laughs> and dragged me away. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's fine, I'm just interested. And it was one of those things that every now and then I sort of, I sort of thought, I really should have turned around and asked what, what it was like. Uh, I think also occasionally when I've given public lectures on Are We Alone, this was quite some time ago, uh, I have actually been taken aside by people at the end and sort of saying, you know, you don't need to ask that question. I have actually met and talked with aliens. And at that stage, I usually find I'm quite busy. You're quite busy. Why is that? I would have thought that you'd be interested. I am interested. Um, and I usually say that's interesting, but there's always something very vague about the story, which sort of... Um, makes me feel that they are not going to have any any details now now don't get me wrong i do talk a little bit to them and i'm certainly always very polite but uh, i think it's going about back about 20 years ago i found myself on a saturday afternoon with nothing to do which given i had four small children at the time was quite miraculous i think the kids had gone on a camp or something mm -hmm. <laughs> and i did what any normal person would just do is head for the bookshop Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I bought some books and I think the kids were away actually for the whole night which was amazing and I found a book for two dollars and it was about a uh, written by a woman who lived in a place called Upway in the Dandenong Ranges in Victoria okay. now that's almost part of Melbourne these days but my mother I know it quite well and my mother grew up there and I thought fantastic I'll be able to buy this book and I because I know the area quite well I'll be able to read what she's got to say and then I will be able to judge for myself whether it's likely she's seen an alien. Mm -hmm. I have never been so disappointed in my life. I still read the whole book. Yeah. But anyway, of course, what happened was her marriage broke down and she went to see a psychologist. Uh -huh. And the psychologist uh, did recovered memory therapy. Uh -huh. And it turned out that the reason her marriage broke down was she was being visited in the night by aliens. Oh. And with the help of the um, uh, psychologist, 
Now, maybe I should just say counsellor, uh, because I can't tell you whether they were paid up member of any professional psychological association or not. This woman managed to recover memories of seeing lights at certain intersections and roundabouts, and, and she used to often wake up and have aliens at the foot of the bed. Now, after reading it, the first thing I noted was this could not in any way be proved. There was not one skerrick of physical evidence, which always... There wasn't, there wasn't one skerrick? Oh, uh, skerrick, sorry. Skerrick, what does that mean? Oh, good question. T hardly any, almost okay. nothing. <laughs> there wasn't one skerrick <laughs> bit of evidence. Okay. Yes. Now, do you know Mary Rodwell? No. Because she, she talks to people who have been abducted by aliens. Ah, or okay, aliens, fascinating. And, and uh, she kind of tells them, kind of acts as a kind of a counsellor to them. Okay. And so um, this is not the same counsellor you're talking about? This no, no, so this is not recovered memory. This is people who... Recovered memory. That's what we're dealing with in your story. Yeah, recovered. my story is recovered memory, which I could talk a bit more about at depth. So what do you think about recovered memory? Oh, recovered memory. Uh, okay, the way the human mind works, every time we remember something, it's like opening a Word document, Microsoft Word document, or a text editor document, in edit format. As we remember the memory gets changed by what's happening to us at the current time and then gets stored again. Uh, so each time we look at a memory, we not only refresh it, uh, we change it. And recovered memory, um, I won't say in every case, uh, but there has been quite a bit of work showing that recover recovered memory is more likely to be implanted memory or suggested memory. So of all the conversations and lectures you've given about Are We Alone and the people you've spoken to, you don't think you've seen any evidence that suggests that aliens have visited the Earth? I have not, but I'm fascinated to hear about uh, the counsellor you were talking about. Um, what does she find when she talks to people? Well, there's a movie called uh, My Mum Talks to Aliens. <gasps> oh! And she was in that. Okay. She was the mother. She was the mother. Oh, that's right. I remember when this... Uh, I remember John Webb telling us about this, uh -huh. and I haven't seen it myself. Okay, so perhaps I should uh, should see it. So, but let me get back to the question. So yeah. you're, you're an astronomer. Yes. And uh, you have talked to people about Are We Alone, and you've heard people tell stories about yes. being visited by aliens and maybe even abducted by aliens. Do you believe any of it? No, unfortunately, much as I would like to, um, I have never been able to find anything that seems remotely plausible. So people are, what, what about this? Why do people then, did so many people disagree with you? It's a good question. Um, in research they've done, they found that during the Middle Ages, uh, people didn't tend to see aliens, but they did see a lot of flaming crosses in skies. Flaming horses? Oh, crosses. Crosses, oh. Yeah, no, I'm talking about medieval Christian Europe here. Uh, even to the extent where they didn't see the comet of uh, Heller's Comet in 1066. Is that right? No. Um, no, 1066 it was seeing, I'm thinking it's the Crab Nebula in the same time. No, Halley, the Bayer Tapestry shows Halley's Comet, but the Crab Nebula, there was not a single report of that uh, in Europe. Uh, yet the Chinese documented it quite well. Now, of course... You're talking about the crab the crabs, nebula? The crab nebula, the crab supernova, which mm. was a similar time. I can't tell you exactly. Um, it was 1054, I think. 1054, okay. I knew it was quite, I knew it was quite close. But people did see uh, portents. So they would see flaming crosses in the sky. They would see apparitions, uh, usually of religious people. Sometimes they would see... Uh, Evil spirits, incubi, succubi, all those sorts of things. Uh, but no reports of flying saucers. The, the flying saucer stuff happened after World War II, and you probably may know more about this than I do, but I, I got the impression it very much started in the US, uh, where there were large rumours about... Um, about the German scientists from Peenemunde being installed in the in the desert, uh, and that there may have been some test flights of highly unusual things. Could you tell us about the Greys and the Norwegians and the I don't know the other types of aliens that you have heard people talk about? Oh, 
I read a book about this, but it was about 25 years ago, so I'm sorry I've forgotten. But I do remember that you can classify them, but I think they all have those big eyes and the big hands. And Why do they have big eyes? Is it dark where they come from? Or? It may be dark where they come from. It may also be non-threatening for humans. Um, humans have a great tendency to love anything with big eyes because babies and puppies and kitten, well, babies and puppies in particular, have big eyes. So we tend to feel safe. Uh, safe around something with big eyes. But you're saying this, that the people have made this up then? Yes. Yes, the subconscious, I think, is um, possibly wants to conjure a friendly alien. Also, maybe it's just that the first people who came up uh, with the idea of these Roswell-type, I always think of them as the Roswell-type aliens, maybe that then took a life on a life of its own as some sort of Jungian archetype or something in so the human... So have you been to Roswell? No, I haven't. Would I've got like to, to go? get there. I'd love to. Why would you like to? Oh, once again, I really, really want to see um, where it was all supposed to happen, even though I know the, uh, the story behind it very well. What story? Tell us the story. What do you think? Right. You... right. Okay. So my understanding is that there were a couple of things that happened together. One was that at a, um, an American Air Force base, I think some unusual object was seen in the sky and it was called a UFO because it was a, literally an unidentified flying object. Now it appears that there may have been some interesting test planes in the area and that the, um, whoever was running the airbase didn't get the memo about the, about the tests. But anyway, he, um, I think he had some phone calls and said, yes, yes, we've definitely detected the UFO. And somehow then it became a flying saucer and the, uh, but around the same time, I believe there was unfortunately a plane crash in the area, which once again was a military thing and there were fatalities. And so uh, a bulk order for coffins went into some local undertaker and then Roswell was born. So you don't think that these were uh, legitimate aliens then? No, I, um, as I said, I'm very open-minded uh, and I do always look at things, but uh, quite some time ago now, perhaps what were we now, 13 or 14 years ago, a student wanted to do an assignment on Roswell. He wanted to write an essay about it. And I said, yes, but I will mark you on the science and the critical thinking. So just be very careful where you get your information from, because there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet that's just not true. Uh, and he came back, I had one that did the Bermuda Triangle as well, and, and they both came back with amazing research that showed that uh, Roswell was probably a number of factors in public imagination. The Bermuda Triangle was just, just plain um, made up. <laughs> fictitious. <laughs> and Ross, oh, I see. So just made... plain fictitious. There was, no, there was no misunderstanding, it was just made up by a journalist. <laughs> and so was the Amityville horror. I don't know if you ever saw um, a movie purporting to be a documentary called The Amityville Horror. The Amityville Horror? I thought it was a horror movie. It was, yes. Yeah, so it was supposed to be a true story, but a journalist oh. once again went back and checked the weather records and none of it was oh. true. <laughs> okay, so, but uh, if you think that there's life elsewhere... Yes. And But all the stories that you've heard from other human beings are kind of not true... Not, that, I have not seen anything yet that would convince me, yes. Well, that means that uh, aliens are not colonize the earth. They have not colonized the earth. And why not? If there's been plenty of time, what's your favorite solution to this eerie science, right. the Fermi paradox? Where are they? The Fermi paradox, where are they? I suspect that we may be the first or we may be one of the early ones. Uh, another possibility is that I think we're now discovering that our own solar system might be a tad unusual. So um, maybe when you get all these hot Jupiters sitting very close to suns and stars and things like that, you know, maybe you don't get nice stable orbits for planets for 4.5 billion years for, the, for life to commonly evolve. So it could be that there are uh, perhaps a hundred communicating civilizations throughout the galaxy and I would imagine that they're so far away from each other. Uh, that I'm just sort of thinking like um, even Alpha Centauri is four light years away. By the time we go to, um, I'm just trying to think something, a cloud I study in space, mix of high mass and low mass star formation, 
feel the molecular cloud just the right place for lots of complex molecules and uh, for, um, for planets with uh, life. It's uh, 700 parsecs away, and this is one of the closest of the most likely places. Uh, what's that? You know, so it's, it's 2,000 light years. So even to get a radio signal to us would be 2,000 years. For something to travel, um, unless they have managed to get light speed travel, then it would be difficult to reach us. But not only that, uh, it's the coverage. We've got this excellent round globe here, which gives the idea Imagine this globe is the civilization. Uh, it's covered with nuclear powered, small unmanned devices that will fly forever at the speed of light. Not totally stupid. Uh, let's imagine that there's, let's try a thousand of them spread over this. This is a planet you're looking so at? So this is a planet. So we're going to launch a thousand of these rockets from different points in the planet, so they will all go off to different star systems. Okay. Now we can target the star systems. Planets, of course, we can't see directly and are not likely to be able to for quite some time. So we target our rockets at the star system and the rockets go off into space and they get close to the star system, you know, within a few hundred light years in each case, which is pretty good navigation when you're heading for something that's 2,000 light years away. Uh, and of course it passes somewhere between the Earth and Alpha Centauri <laughs> and we're none the wiser. <laughs> can it navigate by itself? Ah, uh, it may be able to and so when it detects a planetary body it, um, yes, yeah, so okay, so it comes through, it detects the Sun or Alpha Centauri and it says there's a, uh, okay, there's a star that could be good are there planets? Let's head for the star and see. Oh, yes, there's planets. And then we hop from all the different planets. Possible, but very difficult, technically, I think. Does okay, so let me ask you again. Uh, yeah. Where is everybody? Where is everybody? On their own planet, trying desperately, desperately with big radio telescopes to find signals from anyone else, and everyone's missing each other in space and time. Because why were they missing each other? Probably because the, gal uh, the galaxy is not old enough yet. Maybe. But if uh, it's filled with radio telescopes, we should be able to hear each other. No, our radio telescopes are nowhere near big enough. Uh, Arecibo. Yeah. Uh, actually, if we put our biggest radio telescope, say Arecibo, on Alpha Centauri, mm -hmm. and we actually get it to send out uh, a signal, the LIDAR, I think they have there, which they use for. I don't know, doing stuff with the moon, mapping the moon's surface or timing things, whatever. Um, if you use the LIDAR, that's the strongest signal to escape the Earth. We would just be able to detect that, I believe, with the Arecibo telescope now, if there was a similar setup, but it would have to be beamed at Arecibo. So you're telling me that the Arecibo telescope, if we put a duplicate of that on a planet around Alpha Centauri mm -hmm. A or B, and point it at it, so they're pointing at each other, they'll be just barely able to detect each other. Just barely able to detect each other. Hmm, huh. I, I thought that I could, I thought that they could do this across our galaxy. Ah, uh, right. They, they can do it across the galaxy if the signal's powerful enough. So I'm talking about the technology we have, mm -hmm. but you, we have to assume that the aliens are more involved mm -hmm. than us. And that's the other way that uh, Fermi's paradox may make perfect sense, but maybe we're going to the pe be the people where we're the civilization who gets there first, and maybe it'll be our little uh, robots will be going from planet to planet. So you think that we might be the, the first uh, organisms to evolve radio telescopes? It's possible. Or maybe, maybe there's a lot of other places that are getting to a similar develop, stage of development. I think the other thing is that um, there's been a lot of cultural, technological and scientific advances that have enabled us to get so quickly from... Uh, I would put the start of the Industrial Revolution probably about the beginning of the 18th century, but there, were, there was a lot of work done before that, including in China, uh, in many places around the world and so sometimes in some ways it was the navigators and the travelers that brought a lot of different knowledge and technology together um, and from there okay from 1700 to the year 2001 
400 years and we've gone a long way to building a radio telescope. But I suspect that we could have waited much longer if political, the political situation had been different. Uh, or perhaps it could have happened earlier. I um, have seen suggestions that the, um, that the ancient Greeks uh, probably had everything they needed to start an industrial revolution, but just never seemed to have the interest in doing it. I'm not convinced that's true, but I think there was a, there was a lot of development in measurement and metallurgy and other things that really were very important. Now, you've taught a course called Are We Alone, is that right? Uh, no, I teach, um, I've given, I used to give lectures in Are We Alone, uh -huh. when you were doing it actually, but I have an online course called Brave New World, uh -huh. uh, which looks at uh, using science fiction to help people learn about science. In particular, I'm interested in people's scientific and technological literacy, so I don't want to teach them everything about science. I want to teach them how to, for example, read a Sydney Morning Herald or Canberra Times article and be able to judge whether the science reporting is good or not. And also to be able to do a bit of research to find if they're interested in something, for example, genetic modification is something people feel very strongly about, to actually go and find high quality information themselves without, um, without having to believe what the latest science reporter tells you. So the public and the students that you've talked to, what do you think are their biggest misconceptions about aliens? I think the, that the universe is teeming with intelligent aliens. I think there's an argument, uh, as you say, Fermi's paradox. Uh, wait, 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 which is the misconception? And which is I, the think they, I think a lot of people, right, the misconception is that they don't think critically about how many intelligent civilizations are out there. How do you do that? Ah, that's interesting. You start off with something like thinking through the thought process, process in the Drake equation. Um, I think, and when you do that, you realise that technological civilization could be quite rare. I think the other thing is most of them are quite shocked to realise just how vast space is and just how long it takes a, um, a photon of light to travel from the Earth to any other plausible place where there could be a civilization. So I think we, I think we tend to think a lot about um, about aliens being everywhere, aliens being able to travel at the speed of light, that communication is very easy. I think these, this is the thing that surprises people most is how difficult it would be to communicate with another communicating civilization, even if we we're aware of its existence. Look, do you have any advice to students about thinking about this question? I think um, I think reading about the Drake equation is a great place to start. I think understanding um, the the finite nature of the speed of light. But the other thing I would say is uh, remember to suspend disbelief and um, suspend disbelief. Yes, that means belie believe. Believe. That's right. And in so you want to believe. Yes, and so read, read all the science fiction you can get your hand on, hands on, because actually that will help you to understand what's plausible and what's not. Uh, many of, much science fiction that is actually extremely well written. The, uh, I think there's a little bit more of a tendency now for science fiction and, and fantasy to be blurred, which is slightly different, but I even think the fantasy is, is very helpful. I'm a great fan of the, um, of the Hogwarts or the Harry Potter series, mm -hmm. and I like the efforts that J.K. Rowling goes to to make the magic plausible and make it hang together, even though there's obviously no, even though there's books called The Science of Hogwarts, there's actually no uh, scientific explanation for it, but it does form a logical framework. And so J.K. Rowling is not an alien? She is not an alien and Harry Potter is not science fiction, although that's one of the first discussion questions in my course I asked the kids to think about, the students to think about, is Harry Potter science fiction, why or why not? And uh, I think then it starts to, you know, they start to discuss it. And well, Arthur C. Clarke once said that insufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from magic. Yes. But there's a guy in Germany called Karl Schroeder who said, any, no, no, that's wrong, because any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. Ah, that's an interesting one. No, I know about Arthur C. Clarke and I absolutely agree with him. So you uh, disagree with the second one? 
Oh, no, I agree with him. But I think if it is advanced enough, it may be using, um, it may be using nature to do what it wants or needs to do. I mean, for example, can you send electrons with information travelling through time or space or something of the sort? Things that we wouldn't even, uh, we wouldn't even notice. Well, I guess the idea is that people keep on looking for giant Dyson spheres under the idea that you will monopolize all the energy yes. from your star and then, then give it off as infrared radiation. But that's under the assumption that you want to monopolize all that energy and well, maybe it's not sustainable. The yeah. idea is that if you chainsaw a whole forest, that's easily detectable. But if you're, uh, I don't know, talking about sustainability or management or long-term survival, then you cannot afford to do such things and then you become more like nature. I think that's the idea behind this. That idea. makes perfectly good sense because even now in Australia, we've reached peak electricity. Electricity usage has dropped since I think it was about 2011 or 2012. Now, when I get my electricity bill, I have to remind myself of that sometimes because the prices haven't dropped, but usage has, and right around the world, uh, Germany, uh, three or four months ago, very proudly announced that it had a whole day where the hot, uh, electricity for the whole country was generated by renewables. Our technologies are getting better all the time. Uh, and so I do think that we will use fewer resources in the future, not more. Uh -huh. Okay, so we are getting more sustainable. I, guess any, I believe we are. And do you think any advanced civilization, that's what they yes. do? I think so. Apart from anything else, um, who wants to work in the mines when you don't have to, when you could do it a better way and everyone, everyone can have lots of wonderful solar-powered energy and uh, far more recreational time. So these aliens that are everywhere, what yes. do you think they look like? Ooh, that's a tricky one. We can only go on what we have on Earth. Uh, I think there are some things they can't be. For example, if you were to take a horse and just scale it up by 10 times every dimension, uh, it would not be able to support its own weight. So, so we can actually rule out, we can sort of say, right, aliens might look like horses, but they're not like, going to look like enormous horses. Why couldn't they be on smaller planets with the lower surface gravity? Ah, uh, we'll see, perhaps they can. Yes, so perhaps we do have the giant horses, yes and uh, they are going to have to metabolize somehow. Almost certainly, uh, I would argue they're most likely to be carbon-based, although, mm, well, of course, there's the other possibility, which is the one I like, that um, there's an argument that life may have evolved on Earth because you got sort of clays that would gradually be able to interact with one another and then eventually um, some sort of carbon molecules attached themselves to the clay and didn't need the clay anymore and then of course we've evolved as carbon-based life forms but what are we doing now we're making artificial intelligence so maybe the end point of intelligence on the earth is that the carbon-based life forms are not needed and we will have silicon-based life forms and do you think viruses are alive I would say yes. I know they don't quite satisfy the conditions, but near enough. And I think that's the other thing is that there is a whole gradient. Uh, you know, for example, if you take RNA and amino acids, RNA is not alive, but if you put it in a jar with amino acids, it will do stuff. It will lock onto the right amino acids and it will start to replicate itself. Now we're sitting in Sydney. Do you think Sydney is alive? Sometimes it feels like it, especially Redfern, where we are here. <laughs> Redfern is alive. <laughs> how about Australia or how about the biosphere? The biosphere could well be, could well be alive. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the last two novels in the Foundation series of Isaac Asimov, written much later, uh, where Gaia gets a good Guernsey. Is that right? Yeah, they're okay. fascinating. They're, they're, they're the, I, I like the whole all five of the Foundation novels, but I really enjoyed the last two. And of course, that is the idea that, uh, that in fact, the, the, galaxy or the, the galaxy looks after itself. Oh. As a, as a um, not quite a sentient being, but a being that works together. It just happens to work that way. How about Hoyle's Black Cloud? Oh, that was the, that's why I became a scientist. I love that. Yep, Hoyle's Black Cloud, definitely. Isaac Asimov wrote 
a novel called Nemesis, which is the idea that uh, there was a um, single-celled organisms that were sort of like a fungus that worked together to be so that a whole planet was alive. How about Stanislav Lem? Ah, don't know. Okay. Solaris, for example. Solaris. Ah, I have not come across that one. Okay. Um, what about the idea that there are, right here, between us, there are nano-aliens everywhere? We just oh, haven't... I think that's, uh, that's a good one as well. Um, I think, now, unfortunately, I can't remember the science fiction author's name, except he did work at Caltech as a uh, physicist. Uh, is it Gregory Benford? He wrote a fantastic book. He's Irvine. Ah, right, okay. Um, he wrote, oh, he's in Irvine, right, he's Irvine. Um, he, I think it was Gregory Benford who wrote a great book, and I, I was going to say Timescape, but I don't think that's the right one, uh, about beings on a neutron star, which in fact were um, microns across. And it all hung together, it all worked. So yes, I think that's possible as well. How about might we be inside of an alien? Kind of like you know your neurons in your brain don't know they're in a brain. Maybe we're in part of something that we don't know that we're part of. It's kind I, of like the last scene of uh, Men in Black. Where absolutely, I don't think we can rule that hypothesis out. So how could we test it? I don't see any obvious way except for trying to do what we're doing, which is mapping the universe, uh, exploring space. Uh, but perhaps minds, you know. Uh, the evolution of biological creatures is Darwinian, but cultural evolution is Lamarckian. And I think the more people explore these ideas, someone may well come up with a way to test these ideas. Well, if you were a neuron inside your brain, how would you test the idea that you were, the crazy idea that you were part of a larger brain? Yeah. You try and stop the flow of signals, I think but uh, perhaps feel the magnetic field or the uh, electric field from nearby neurons. Yeah. Okay. Neurons, it's a, it's a good <laughs> idea. I must admit, you, you're putting me on the spot here, right? How about <laughs> aliens made out of, I don't know, vacuum fluctuations? Maybe the dark energy that we've just recently detected in the universe is really the conversations of aliens and it's, it's energy and it's noise and it's unclumpable energy. Could that be signals of aliens talking to each other? Yep. Uh, can't be falsified at the moment, but I think we should definitely think about it. If I gave you a hundred, I gave you a billion dollars to try to answer the question, are we alone, what would you do with it? What would I do with a billion dollars? You would have dollars? to try to answer the question, are we alone? How uh, would you approach that? Okay. I think I'd start with what I know, and that is that um, I would probably build a bigger radio telescope and put more effort into the current SETI search because I still think that's probably the best thing that we have going with us. But do you know where I would look now that I'm thinking about this on the run? I would take that billion dollars and use it to explore physical parameter space that we haven't explored so far. For example, things that happen very fast in time, uh, things that happen uh, gravitational waves, I guess, is on everyone's uh, lips at the moment, but can we study gravitational waves and learn something from them? I would try and see, so if you imagine parameter space as measuring things that happen on very small time intervals, which means you, mean you need to measure things that are very fast, at very low energies, at very high energies, and on large scales, and I think new parameter space would be our best chance for detecting detecting life, whatever form it may take. Now this question, are we alone, is it an important question? Yes. Why? Because it will completely change the way humanity sees itself. It, um, I think for humans to realise that they're part of something much bigger will, with time, change human thinking. Now we've had many paradigm shifts since the, uh, since the Middle Ages, or actually since the, um, the time 
uh, the classical era, obviously we went through a stage in Europe during the Middle Ages where people were very inwardly focused, uh, they stopped thinking, they stopped trying to invent, they, uh, they led a very spiritual life, of course it was different in the Middle East and, and China, but even there there's been large paradigm shifts uh, in the last, you know, since the, the uh, since the Reformation I guess in Europe, and I speak that of which I know most. Um, the paradigm shift against the one type of Christianity. But, but let has me been bring, try to bring you back to earth here. Yeah. Let's say I'm a 20 year old student, a guy. Yep. I'm interested in sports and women and sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Why would I be interested in this question, are we alone? You may very well not be. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably just taking my course because you want to finish your degree and it's online. <laughs> However, I think that. Uh, I think you will find that I've been impressed. It would be of as much interest to people as the suffering, discovering gravitational waves, I think, and that's certainly been all over Facebook. But I think it would be more disruptive and more interesting than that because it is going to disrupt a lot of tightly held beliefs on planet Earth. Although people are amazingly good at adapting their beliefs. How about religious views? How would it change that? That's in particular what I'm thinking of. There's some religious views that would not change much at all. Uh, these are what I call the small c Christian churches. Uh, small c Christian churches. It may be an Australian way of, of doing things. So there's, uh, I tend to see the Christian churches and as I said, this is, these are the ones I'm most familiar with as being on a spectrum. So they're uh, churches we call fundamentalist who believe that you take the Bible literally. Uh -huh. uh, and then you can sort of move to a much more humanist perspective. I don't know if you know uh, Shelby Spong, um, an American who has come over occasionally, and he, he sort of sees religion as more of a bit of a spiritual element, not too much of a supernatural element. But most religions say, you know, you are special, you people who believe in me, or we're, you know, our tribe yes. is special. But yes. along comes an aliens and they say, boom, that shoots that idea That shoots water. that idea so, so away. So that doesn't sound like it's going to be much help to people who believe in these special. In Australia, I can tell you that it's about 25% of the population who believe in taking the Bible literally and New Earth creationism. Uh, I think the proportion is much higher in the US. And I think those people will find it very hard. Okay. So, but a lot of people think of... Uh, aliens as somehow little gods. They know everything and they've been around and they're going to solve all our problems. Yes. It sounds to me like a god. Yes, and uh, I think people invest aliens with all the things that they wish that somebody would just take responsibility for their lives, come in and sort everything out. Uh, and so in fact, of course, you... Are you guilty of that? No. Why not? What, are you special? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> just realistic. <laughs> I think when I was a kid, I might have, might have sort of thought about that, but I think I was more interested in seeing what the spaceships looked like. At the end of the movie Contact, Jodie Foster's character is talking to a child, and, it's, and the child says, are we alone? And Jodie says, well, if we're the only ones out there, it's an awful lot of waste of space. Yes. What do you think of that? It's a lovely sentiment. I think it has no bearing on whether there's life elsewhere in the universe. Why is it a lovely sentiment? To me, it seems like a vain statement. It's kind of like, you know, the Europeans coming to Australia and not finding any other Europeans, and so it's calling it terra nullis. It's not worth anything here. It's a waste of space because no one's That's like me here. That's a good point. That is actually a, that is actually a very good point, that um, even if there isn't life out there, the rest of the universe obviously has value. We're, we're of no consequence to the universe. So why would it be a waste of space? It's not. You're right. But you, but you just said that it's a, wonder, a romantic. It sounded, it's a nice sentiment, I think I would say. It's a kind nice, of got that nice sort of feel a good. A nice sentiment if you don't think about it. If you don't think, exactly, <laughs> if you don't think about it. Yeah, I, I'd say it's also a little bit like the noble savage myth, uh, which annoys the life out of me. You'll find that there are people who believe that all you've got to do is find uh, a civilization untouched by Europeans and that these people will have evolved the perfect society and it's actually quite a demeaning myth 
because what you're actually saying is that these savages live in perfect harmony with nature, uh, but they have no technology, they have no history, they have no past. So to then invest them with perfection is quite demeaning. Probably not quite as demeaning as, uh, as, as you say, what happened to the indigenous population in Australia when Europeans came, but... Uh, Harriet, Harriet Tubman, American Civil War, said, I freed a, a thousand slaves, I could have freed a thousand more if they had known they were slaves. So I'm wondering if that has any bearing on the type of consciousness raising that might happen to us when we get contact with aliens. Yes, I do think that it, it, it would be the most stupendous discovery because I think, uh, I guess, uh, I have a book, I have two books on my bookshelf to read, and I'm sorry I can't remember the author's name. One's called 1491, and the other's called 1493. And you can probably guess it was what the Americas were like just before and just after Columbus. Mm -hmm. uh, but 1493 is about what they call a Columbian exchange, and the world changed beyond recognition when the civilizations of the Americas got in touch with the civilizations of Europe. And it wasn't particularly good for the civilizations of the Americas, unfortunately. Um, but Europe changed beyond belief. Uh, new foodstuffs, new way of doing things. Now Hawking, Stephen Hawking has yes. pointed this out and he says that because of the history of the disastrous history of civilizations coming in contact with each other that we should keep our head down and not send out messages he has said that. Uh, I would actually say that the chances of mess messages being read are not very high, but he may have a point. I don't think it's a big enough risk for me to worry about whether we send messages out or not. I think there's many other ways that catastrophe could come to the planet Earth. Now, you've said that if we do contact aliens, that it would be a tremendous, I guess, revolution in the way we think and the way we think of ourselves. I think so, yes. But I've also heard people say, whether we find them or not, either one is mind-boggling. Either one is mind-boggling. So I, why, yeah. why would, I mean, if, if, the, if you're going to do a, an experiment and no matter what happens, it'll be mind-boggling, why don't you just say, it's mind-boggling, you don't need to do the experiment. Ah, very interesting. The, the reason for that is a positive result is decisive. A negative result just tells you that your experiment is not sensitive enough yet. Well, unless you've done a lot of negative now, experiments of and, do, and, and explored all the yes. parameter space, then you do have a... Yeah, and eventually, and then that, I think, in itself, in some ways, that would be even more mind-boggling, except that I think most, most people, aliens are something that you find in the movies. I think most people don't, it doesn't really, impinge on their consciousness that there could be civilizations out there in the universe. Well, we have these two results and they're opposite. One is we're alone, the other is we're not alone. How do they boggle the mind in different ways? Okay, if life on Earth is the only conscious life in the universe, uh, it means we were the result of an incredible accident. Uh, an incredible series of improbable accidents. When you say we, you mean we, uh, Homo uh, sapiens. Uh, homo sapiens, I guess, but all you know, all the higher life forms on Earth. All the what? All the higher life forms. And on what Earth. are the higher life forms on Earth? Oh, dogs and cats. And dogs, cats, and humans. Humans, bonobos, chimpanzees. Oh, uh, snakes. Frogs. Nah. Worms. Nah, definitely so not you worms. Say, okay, who? What do you mean by higher life forms? Right. What I would describe as um, life that's self-aware, uh, people argue about this a lot, but there's been some fascinating stuff done in research in animal consciousness recently, mm -hmm. and there's good reasons to believe that many more creatures than we've ever realised are actually self-aware. Hard to test. Uh, but you can actually do it and you know some great experiments with babies etc as well so I don't see homo sapiens as being particularly special I think obviously we were just that bit more intelligent or maybe more that bit more good with our hands probably something to do with having big brains and having to run run down predators on the Serengeti or something like that whatever it was it wasn't it wasn't design it was just <laughs> just coincidence now, now, Australia has been drifting by itself for about 80 million years. Yes. And uh, you know, the human brain case increased in size in about two to three million years, factor of three. So 
if there is such a thing as this intelligent niche, then why didn't kangaroos develop during this 80 million years into the intelligence niche? There were no humans then. No, I don't, I, I don't necessarily think there's an intelligence niche. I think, um, I think kangaroos actually are surprisingly intelligent, depending on how you define it. Um, but how long would you, let's suppose that humans kill, we kill ourselves, how long would it be before another species on Earth produced a radio telescope, if ever? If, if ever. I would be surprised if another one did produce a radio did telescope. Did or did not? I, I don't never. think, an, uh, never would be my guess. Now, never's a long time. Yes, especially near the end. Yeah, but um, I don't know, gorillas? I mean, I've seen Planet of the Apes too. Uh, gorillas, uh, chimpanzees? Is it possible? Uh, not in the species they're in. Uh, you know, they, their species, that would be Lamarckian evolution, I think, if you were to imagine that chimpanzees would change. Uh, it would have to be a new species entirely. Now, that we do understand that there, over the last two or three million years, there have been many different types of hominids. Uh, Cro-Magnon man, I think, is, is uh, or Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, we're the ones that triumphed. I think we killed all the others out or interbred with them. Uh, so whether that could happen again, given another 20 million years, maybe, but that's a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so any advice for students about uh, how to think about this question, are we alone? Okay, there are no rules. Um, I think think about it as logically as you can, but read widely, particularly science fiction, and don't discount any possibility. One of the other things I remember about, I'm thinking about the book Contact, but I think it came across in the movie as well, was that uh, Jodie Foster's aliens were actually some sort of all-powerful, all-knowing, all-knowing sort of creature that managed to rule the universe and just gave humans a little glimpse of the fact that there was someone else out there. Um, and they were, I would say, once again, appearing to work through nature. Uh, also, they... Um, appeared to, it wasn't obvious that they had bodies, they were some sort of energy or something of the sort. The end of Arthur C. Clarke's uh, 2001 series, I think, uh, with 3001 at some stage, one of the books anyway, um, the aliens are actually spirits like your dark energy without, um, without bodies, any of those things are possible. So think as broadly as you can and don't rule anything out. Uh, but always think a little bit logically about it. There are some things in the universe that are possible and some are not. We don't know everything that's possible. Well, for example, in the, I think in Contact, there was something about the number pi, and it's a digit that's that goes right. on forever. Yeah. And because it goes on forever, that means it contains all the information in the universe, and so that's the only thing you ever need to know. Somehow the Bible is in there, or that's every right. textbook is in there. So, <laughs> so what do you think of that idea? <laughs> Uh, okay, you can make a lot of patterns out of noise, especially if you have an infinite amount of noise. That's right, okay. <laughs> I'm sure I can find wonderful things in Pi if I have time. <laughs> okay, and uh, let me ask you again, uh, are, are we alone? Probably not. Because? Just because I don't think life on Earth uh, as we know it is a, um, a series of such uh, incredible accidents that it won't happen again. Whether you'll get communicating beings, that one is tougher. Although I actually think the toughest thing was probably going from the, um, the single-celled organisms to the multi-celled organisms after 2.5 billion years. I think that was possibly what set the whole thing in train.